This is the World Organic News for the week ending 9th of April 2018. John Moore reporting. It's possible you may be hearing some bird noises in the background as we're doing an outside recording this week, so please bear with us and enjoy the sounds. As I discussed last month with the new vision statement for the podcast and blog, Decarbonise the Air, Recarbonise the Soil, I'm calling on my listeners to put forward ideas for an interview episode once a month. If you know anyone who is doing either part of the vision, I'd love to hear from them. Or indeed, if you are on the front line doing the work yourself, drop me a line at podcast at worldorganicnews.com. This week, we examine a vineyard being run along the principles of Masanobu Fukuoka. The establishment goes by the name of Vinny's Son Allegra. They also produce olive oil as well as grapes. To reinforce the principles, let's quote from the post. Quote, The Japanese farmer, agricultural scientist and philosopher is celebrated for his method of natural farming and revegetation of arid land threatened with desertification. Fukuoka realised that nature was perfect just as it was. He believed that problems in nature only arose when humans tried to improve upon nature and use the countryside solely for their own benefit. He became an advocate of no-till, no-herbicide, grain cultivation farming methods traditional to many indigenous cultures by creating a particular method of farming, commonly referred to as natural farming or do-nothing farming. End of quote. There is so much in this quote. To understand how Fukuoka came to these conclusions, a reading of the One Straw Revolution would be useful. I've included a link to a PDF download for the book in the show notes. The key turning point for Fukuoka, as I read it, was noticing how winter grasses push their way through the debris of summer grasses during autumn, and the reverse being true in spring. We need to add in a cultural element into this narrative, Zen. This is much misused word in the English-speaking word. It assumes the world is already perfect. We just need to open our eyes to see the perfection. There is much more to the philosophy, but this is a good starting point. So combining this insight into the summer-winter grains with the starting, was the starting point for Fukuoka's method. As it evolved, he distilled his ideas down to four principles applicable to any landform or agricultural setting. From the post, the first principle is explained. Quote, According to Fukuoka's observation, the soil cultivates itself. There is no need for man to do what roots, worms and microorganisms do better. Furthermore, Ploughing the soil alters the natural environment and promotes the growth of weeds. Therefore, his first principle was no ploughing or turning of the soil, end quote. If we give this some thought, it seems reasonable. Soil existed for a long time before the species Homo strode upright upon the planet. While we are great at problem solving, I would argue it is what makes us human. But that's a whole other different podcast. We are also great at creating those problems we need to solve. As I've mentioned in other episodes, not ploughing, tilling or digging flies in the face of 10,000 years of agricultural and horticultural practice. Moving to no-till has been and is a slow process which occurs in the mind of farmers as much as in the soil. I think I've made the case for no-digging on so many occasions some of you will be hitting the skip-forward button. It is, I believe, the very first step in a movement towards a recarbonised soil. It is that important. So to principle number two. Quote, Secondly, in an unaltered environment or natural environment, the orderly growth and decay of plant and animal life fertilises the soil without any help from man. End quote. We always think we can help. We always think we can improve upon nature. There are times when we can. I know I am unable through natural selection to fly, but with the use of technology I can. A crude example, but you get the picture. At the level of the soil where the complexity is mind-blowing, relying upon systems billions of years in their development might not be a bad idea. Indeed, even thinking we can improve upon an almost innumerable number of adjustments through time in the evolution of soil, soil biota, plants and animals would be the definition of hubris. There are still things we can observe and assist when it comes to soil, but basically the soil knows, in inverted commas, what it is doing. Leave it alone. Principle number three, quote, Weeds are the enemy of the farmer. Fukuoka observed that when he ceased ploughing, his weed growth declined sharply. This occurred because ploughing actually stirs deep-lying weed seeds and gives them a chance to sprout, end quote. 
There's more to this than just the stirring up of weed seeds, obviously. The other thing which happens with ploughing is the creation of soil conditions similar to when the glaciers melted at the end of the Pleistocene and the start of the Holocene, our current geological period. We'll leave the arguments on the Anthropocene to another episode. These soil conditions result in massive massive amounts of weed species, in inverted commas, usually of the broadleaf type, attempting to cover the bare soil and trap the available nutrients in their bodies. I'm sure given sufficient time, these species would be replaced by others more useful to our needs, but why create the situation in the first place? Do not create weed-friendly conditions and we are less likely to have weeds. Simples. Principle number four. And this is a longish quote. Finally, what to do about pests and blights? As Fukuoka's grain fields and orchards became more and more to resemble a natural ecology, with the proliferation of plant species and varieties growing all in a jumble, they also created a nature-like habitat for small animals. In such a habitat, Fukuoka noted that nature's own balancing act prevented any one species from gaining the upper hand. Left to herself, nature prefers hardier stock. Fukuoka's fourth principle is no dependence on chemical pesticides, end quote. And this is where the do-nothing comes into play, in do-nothing farming. You set up the system as close to nature as possible and then do nothing. Let the natural systems just do their thing. We have as a species a tendency to poke things with a stick, just to see how they work. But really, in this case, we shouldn't. We have little knowledge of what goes on underground, so that the do-nothing is designed to stop us breaking what's working perfectly well. Again, this flies in the face of agricultural horticultural orthodoxy. Yet Fukuoka grew soil like a madman. Indeed, I'm sure that's a description most innovators have had to suffer. There are adjustments that have to be made when transitioning to Fukuoka's natural farming. He speaks in the One Straw Revolution about the disasters that occurred in his Mandarin orchard. As his father had pruned these trees, as per the standards of the day, so that they could be sprayed for pests, the first year without pruning led to many cross branches. These rubbed against each other, created opportunities for insect pests and so on. Fukuoka advocates for a central leader pattern of growth with most trees for this is how they grow in the wild. This can make harvesting difficult for humans, but not for stock. Using stock to clean up the windfalls has many benefits. I tried this in an old orchard with sheep. I had apples, peaches, plums and pears growing. By placing the ewes and grower lambs in the orchard with a teaser ram, two things happened. Firstly, the ewes all synchronised their ovulation cycles. And secondly, they went into a period of rising nutrition with all the fruit sugars. After three weeks, I removed the teaser ram and the growers and introduced a ram with a marker harness. He covered all the ewes within two days, leaving a chalk mark on the ewes. This had the added bonus at the other end of gestation of all the ewes dropping within two days. We went from 110% lambing to 175%, and as it was a small flock of 23, I could keep an eye on all of them, and we achieved 175% weaning. The orchard was then left free of sheep until the following mating season. The chickens were allowed to roam around in the intervening period. This resulted in no issues with coddling moth as the larval stages were dealt with by the chooks. The point I think that is too often lost is the need for animals in food production systems. The plants and the animals evolve together so leaving out one half of the equation will lead to problems. Natural farming methods have been used from small holdings to 10,000 acre rice farms, all based on the four principles. It can be done. I would direct you to Fukuoka's two main books, The One Straw Revolution and Natural Farming. The links, as I said, are in the show notes. And with that, I'll draw this episode to a conclusion. Remember, decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. As a podcast listener, you may be thinking about podcasting your own show, but you're not sure where to begin. Drop over to mrjohnmore.com and pick up some checklists to get you started on the process. I'd love to see you join the medium. And a transcript of this episode is available at worldorganicnews.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week. (laughs) 